had a really good run um, this year and it looks like the, the crop is up. Um, you know, some people are talking, talking, you know, 15% or higher up on last year's um, yields. So that's really, really good. Um, but yeah, now, the, you know, it's like a perfect storm. Now we've got to get through it all. G'day and welcome to the Farms Vice podcast with your host, Jack Creswell. Whether you farm it, service it, or just love it, this podcast is for you. We'll bring you the techniques and technologies you can implement into your day straight from the leaders and innovators themselves. Spread the Farms Vice so that we can reach more farmers right across Australia. Follow us on all of your socials at Farms Vice and let's get into this episode. Welcome back to the Case IH series and today episode we'll be talking to Lawrence Polger where sugar has always been a part of his life. We'll dive into the history of sugarcane harvesters and how Case H is playing a part in getting the crop off this year. So let's get into this episode and we'll let Lawrence explain it all. Well, g'day and welcome to the Farms Wise podcast. Lawrence, very good to have you coming in from Northern Queensland. How's everything where you are? We usually like to start with the weather first. Yeah, look, Jack, um, thanks for having me. Look, the weather at the moment is um, a little bit cloudy. Um, we'd love to have the sun shining, but we don't at the moment. Seeing a couple of showers come through last night, um, some storms and whatnot. But uh, yeah, it is cloudy at the moment. Yeah, it's a bit of a wet one probably on the east coast leading into the grains harvest. But what we'll be talking about on this episode is everything sugar, the sugar industry. And hopefully, Lawrence, you can give us a few good key insights into what they are. Yep, more than happy. Beautiful. So on the episodes, we start off to get to know who you are, Lawrence, and what's your background and your role within Case IH today. Look, uh, Jack, I've been in the agricultural industry for quite some years now. I've been working with uh, Case IH ANZ for 10 years, um, now in my 11th year. Um, I've worked in different parts of the business as well, both the after sales side of the business and now going into the sales side of the business. Um, so looking after the products of Optum, Puma and Sugarcane Harvester. So the product manager talking one-on-one with our field staff, also talking to the dealers, customers and um, liaisoning changes and impacts that we're seeing here in our market and making sure that that's getting across the line to the factories and um, you know pushing for improvements and pushing for what our markets needs and wants are so yeah it's been it's been exciting I've been in this new role now for um, a good 12 months Um, but yeah no really looking forward to it in the past like I said I was doing um, parts and service, um, which was really good up here in North Queensland and also doing a product management role with sugarcane harvesters. And now um, that's totally turned into a product management role, both on Optum Puma and sugarcane harvesters. Yeah, beautiful. I'm keen to get into this episode because it's a new industry for the podcast, but also myself, I did a trip up to Queensland earlier on in the year and just Passing the sugar cane itself is pretty phenomenal to look at the crop, what it's doing, and probably the different sort of tactics to what you do um, further down south where we are. So it's good to get into this on this Case H series. Um, so start off, what what are sugar cane farmers up to currently? What sort of stage are they? Bit of okay. delay in the process yeah. as well? Yeah, so, so look, uh, uh, sugar cane farmer always has its normal season, you know, we, uh, we cut the crop, we then if we're returning a crop, normally on an average, um, farmers will return the crop from three to five years. So, so we have a plant and then it goes to first return, second return, third return. So, so it's actually, we call it a third return, but it's actually the fourth time that that, um, that, that crop's actually been through the growing pro- process, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then they then they decide on on what they're going to do, whether they're going to um, return that crop again because that variety of of um, plants has given them good yield, good sugar. Um, it's also being cut uh, at a good quality. So you know, 
if the ground is wet and the and the crop is cut when it's wet, it then impacts the returning season or the returning of that plant. Um, so then, you know, the farmers are making choices as they go along all the time, talking one-on-one -on -one with their contractor, so the actual person that's coming in and doing the harvesting. And then they make decisions on what the following year is going to look like for them. On average, people do know what their, uh, what would you say, their plot of ground can harvest. Yep. Um, and then they make decisions on, you know, can they increase their yield by going to a different variety or no, they're looking at forward selling their sugar because in the sugar industry, you can um, forward sell up to 75% of your sugar um, with different markets with different um, uh, markets that are globally um, buying sugar. Um, and then from there, they'll make business decisions on what they do moving forward. So currently we're in the harvest phase um, and then in the harvest phase you have different um, uh, what, what would I call it different actual things that take place so so you know normally you get rid of your plant cane straight away so so your cane that was plant say you know six months earlier or 12 months earlier and then when the season as the season goes on you then get rid of your cane that you're going to what we call plow out so so we're going to cut that crop for the last time in its life and then we're going to go in, we're going to um, disc it in, plow it in. Um, and then we we make a decision whether we're going to follow that block. So give the ground time to rest yep. or we will put in a, an alternate crop. Like, um, you know, a lot of people use um, beans up here because it's very good for the soil. It opens it right up, lets all the uh, nutrients get right into the ground again. And then um, they'll plant it the following year. So next year. Beautiful. So it's all guns blazing um, up there currently for the harvest season. What's the yeah. harvest looking outlook sort of look like? Look, the, the harvest up here this year has been quite good. Um, yeah. You know, North Queensland, um, it's called God's country for a reason. Um, it's really, really good. We've got the sunshine. We've got the water. Um, it doesn't always fall into the pattern that we like. You know, sometimes we do get some rain events when we don't want rain. Um, but at the present time, it's going really, really well. The yield is definitely up um, on last year's uh, crop. Look, the and, and also the yield is varying on how much it's up, you know, all the way from Mossman down to, to Bundaberg. And then, you know, we've got Northern Rivers as well that um, are big players in the sugar sugar cropping um they've been attacked with some tragic weather events earlier this year that has wiped out a lot of their crop um but in saying that they have bounced back and i believe that they're going to still get a harvest in um but then you know northern rivers they also do a lot of different cropping they they do a two-year cycle we call it so so up to 40 percent of their crop will be actually carried over for a two-year stint Yep. Um, so, you know, if you, if you grow, I don't know, uh, let's just use round numbers, 10,000 tonne of cane, you know, you may, you may get 3,000 tonne of cane and carry it over for a two year season. So down in Northern Rivers, they do it a little bit different as well. Yeah. Okay. So quite varied, but on the up, um, in terms of harvest, 15% increase in yield, what is yeah. that attribute towards, is that the conditions, the climate conditions currently, or is it? Yeah a few technology changes out there no i think i think it's got to do with both aspects that you just brought up you know we had some really good rain at the beginning of the year um you know rain always brings us a lot of nutrients and whatnot um to to the crop um instead of you know flood irrigating or um, different uh, aspects of irrigation but also the farmers have gotten a lot smarter in the way that they're you know applying their fertilizers looking at different blends of fertilizer. You know, it's not just all about putting it, putting on the old traditional way. Um, they're looking at different um, levels of fertilizer. They're also looking at, you know, liquid fertilizer instead of just granular. So I, I would say, honestly, Jack, it's both sides of the coin. Um, you know, the, the, the sugar industry is definitely an industry that looks for change um, and embraces change. Um, and, and that's probably one thing that I love about this job is, you know, you're, you're talking about generations um, when we're in the sugar industry, you know, 
there's still uh, a lot of generations on farming sites that you can talk to and understand how how the soils change, how the different varieties have changed, and also SRA Australia are always developing new varieties that are giving us you know higher yield or or higher sugar or what it may be that the farmer is looking for. So, yeah, I think it's both sides of the coin there, Jack. Yeah, very sort of diverse and unique industry all at the same sort of time um, and how it sort of worked. Maybe that the, what consumers do, has that really predicted it over the last five years um, moving into sugarless products? Have you seen from your end maybe or no? Um, yes and no. Um, I think, you know, we, we're always going to need sugar. Yeah. Um, you know, sugar is something, whether whether it's something that cures a product, whether it's something that actually maintains um, the freshness of a product, we're, we're, we're going to need some type of sugar. I think I think one thing that has driven um, a lot of the pricing or a lot of the drive here in Australia has been what's happening in other parts of the world. Um, a lot of the other parts of the world that grow sugar are going into ethanol um, for their fuel sources um, and their energy sources. Um, here in Australia, we've been a little bit slow um, to take that up. Um, we still hold in solely, as far as I know, um, you know, make all our sugar into uh, cons- consuming for, for the human body. Um, there's not a real lot happening in the renewable side of it with energy, um, where the rest of the world has really grabbed that. So when when you talk about India and places like that, that are putting quite high percentages of their sugar into making um, energy, whether it be fuel or, or whatnot, it then leaves a big hole on the open market for the Australian um, farmers to then put their, their sugar on. Yeah. Okay. So for um, just going back before we move on into that, you mentioned before contractors, for with their machinery coming through and actually harvesting, is that actually more prominent than what farmers actually own the equipment? Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. it's so, a more specialized role. Yeah. I, I would say we can don't count me on it, but there I would say there is definitely a larger percentage of um our harvesting is done by contractors instead of um uh, farmer owned equipment. Yes, there is a lot of farmers that, that are at quite a large scale that will own their own harvester and transport equipment, um, but majority of them do get in contractors. And now, you know, some of them contractors are cutting 100,000 tonne of cane a year. Um, so, so there may be a number of farmers within that one contractor that he looks after, and it also then gives the mill a um, uh, a lot more control in the way of, you know, their, their bin deliveries and whatnot if they're dealing with uh, um, bigger organisations or bigger contractors than um, standalone little ones. Yeah, beautiful. And what is actually the yield of sugarcane per hectare or per acre? Look, it varies. It varies a lot. Um, you know, uh, I don't really want to quote anything because it does change from, you know, all the way from Mossman all the way down to, to Bundaberg. But the yield, the yield in which the, the harvester sees in each different area, we are finding the farmers are getting a lot more out of their soil than what they have in previous years. And going back to your question before, I think it has a lot to do with the technology and the weather events that we're seeing. But the yield does vary quite a lot, Jack. Yes, yeah, certainly. And it's also great to see that they're sort of benchmarking off their own individual area rather than going, geez, up north there, producing high yields, but maybe your soil, you just can't get that out of it. So it's good to see as well. But mostly what I'm keen on is finding a little bit more out about cane equipment and how far it's actually come across the years. Now, it's been going for a fair few years in the harvesting, contracting, especially as you spoke about before, they're more prominently with the machinery. How far has that actually come across the years? Do you have a bit of a timeline there you can run us through? Yeah, look, Jack, if you look back a couple of years ago, Case IH Australia got to celebrate 75 years of livestock. Now, back in the early, early days and where it all started was, was you know, the Toff brothers down there in Bundaberg. Yep. Um, for me, for me, it's something quite special that, you know, two brothers um, saw an opportunity um, to, to help out 
their their local community. As we all know, you know, Bundaberg is very well known for for their sugar industry. Um, that that is changing now over time, but you know, the actual concept of turning um, a, a hand cutter um, or manual labor into mechanical. Um, labor as such done by a machine for me I find it very fascinating um, you know back in the early days it was just cutting it as a full stick um, then being uh, transported onto wagons and then taken into the mill on rail these days yes it is sort of the same concept but you know we're turning a full stick of cane into billets um, and then sending it to the mill but in that process as such Jack our, our technology has allowed us to, to get uh, very minimum losses um, for the contractor and the farmer, um, allowing them to, you know, get as much value as they can out of that one stick of cane. The, the, the technology is forever growing. Um, and, you know, the, the automation, which is coming into our machines that we've seen quite a high revolution in the last six years of, you know, instead of, an operator pressing a thousand buttons at once to get the machine to, to cut the cane. We're looking at, you know, three or four buttons, which allows the machine to, um, to automate some of the key processes in cutting the cane. But I think one of the, the things that the sugar industry or, or myself when talking to the factory that, that we never want to get rid of is the actual operator's input. Yep. You know, a lot of these operators that we see cut sugar cane, they've been in the in the cane fields for many, many years, um, and they bring a lot of knowledge to the table. And for me, it's very important that we don't lose that knowledge. Um, me personally, I come from a family that we used to cart cane um, for 10 years, um, both my father and uncle. And for me, I grew up in the sugar fields, but you were always learning and developing ways to, to, to do it better, to do it safer, um, and to also make, make more money at the end of the day. That's what we're all, all in the game for. And I think what the Toff brothers first brought to the table, we have developed that into a machine today that, that brings all that um, to the table again, you know, safety, profitability, um, and also, you know, listening to the customers and what their needs and wants are. So the technology is a big thing for us here in, in sugar, you know, in grain where you're from, you guys have been many, measuring, sorry, yield for many, many decades for us here in sugar. It's very new, but we are seeing a lot of benefits in actually measuring that yield. So, um, you know, case IH Australia and case IH global are really, really measuring down into, you know, controlled trafficking, GPS lines, yields, um, return on investment from, from different speeds that the, that the machine may travel at to then get a better return on their investment or a better return on that plant that has just been cut. So the technology is forever growing, um, but we are still pioneers of what the Toff brothers first brought to the table. Yeah, I think it's amazing the Oztoff cane harvest and also the story of the Toff brothers. Um, if you've got some time, definitely go out and check check it just up on Google to see and the KSOH website. You'll be able to find some pretty cool information about the history of Australian agriculture um, right there in front of us, and especially coming from the sugar industry. Definitely a, a unique one and how Case is playing a role in delivering that information and knowledge. Just like you said before, you don't want autonomous to take over you still need that operator's knowledge pushing the buttons but also probably reading what's happening in live operation as well at case ih we know you're the ones out there tending to the earth before the day begins and long after it ends so the least we can do is go along for the ride our dealers will be on call and call outs help bit by bit and share the grit. They'll source the parts and play their part to reduce your downtime. From sun up to tools down, it's what you do, it's what we do, it's the least Case IH can do. To find your nearest Case IH dealer, visit caseih.com forward slash ANZ. So using the 
Oztoff cane harvester. How does that actually work for those not really in the industry there, Lawrence? What happens to this and how's the process all sort of pan out? Yeah, so so what the cane harvester does is it comes up to um, a row of cane, which is yep. we call it um, planted in a drill. Um, it cuts it off at a ground level, um, which then feeds a full stick of cane up the feed train. So the feed train is a is um, a number of rollers, um, steel rollers that are moving um, in the reverse direction. So so clockwise. So it's pushing the cane up to the back of the machine, uh, which has then got a set of chopper drums, um, which has got knives on it. Now that can vary um, in different areas of Australia and also in different areas of the world, whether there's, you know, three blades per shaft, four blades per shaft or five blades per shaft. That then Jack cuts it into um, billet lengths. Um, so a segment of billets, um, which is then fed into an elevator. Now, when it gets into the elevator, the machine has an opportunity to pull some trash off it. So, so a stick of cane, has a fiber type, uh, what, what would you say, body to it with then trash, with a leaf matter. Um, the, the mill does not want that leaf matter. Um, we, they, they do not want that brought to the mill. It's very hard to process. Um, and then it's also, it slows down their actual milling um, process as well. So the machine has an opportunity to pull or suck the trash off, off the billet that has been chopped into a length. Um, and then fed up to the elevator where it then gets another opportunity to clean the billet at the top of the elevator, which is then lowered into uh, a cane bin and taken to the rail system and then moved on to the mill. And how much does the harvest actually hold before you have to unload auger out? No, so it's it's always augering. It's, it, there, is no, there is no mass carried on the machine at all. Yeah, right. So it's quite free running and you have someone coming along, picking it up as you go. All the time. Yep. Yep. There is always um, a so-called, what you guys would know it as, a chaser bin, chaser bin. under the yep. ele elevator. Um, yeah. Gathering the gathering the billets or, or collecting the billets, better to say. Once once that bin under the elevator is full, the, the harvest will stop. Yep. until the next um, the next transporter comes underneath. But in saying that too, Jack, it's very, very quick. Nine times out of 10, there is a, a transporter waiting behind the other transporter. One transporter will drive out, the other one will drive under, and it's within three to five seconds. Yeah, nearly keep it rolling as it goes. Correct, correct. It's, it's a very high demanding industry. Yeah, absolutely. Very intensive as well. Um, and the sort of lots I've seen up there, uh, it's just beautiful to see, especially we hadn't dried off actually. So it was just prior to coming into harvest. So it was good to see it in full growth as well. But we've sort of spoken about the harvesting. What sort of equipment are they using up there um, to actually plant the crop and that preparing the paddocks, the fields for it up there? Yeah. So look, uh, again, um, it all it all starts the same way. We actually yep. use billets um, to to plant in the ground, um, and that's done by what we call a billet planter, um, which plants a plants the billets into a into a row, um, which is then controlled out in in a in a sequence of measurements. Um, you know, and that measurements change from from one area of Australia to another area in the way of the distance between the the rows or the the drills. Yep. Um, that then that then comes up to a certain size. Then they will water the the um, plant, or naturally be watered by rain. After that, then the farmer will come through. He will then hill it up. So so at the present time, the water is being put on top of the plant. Then once they hill it up, the water then goes beside the plant. If that makes sense, they move. Um, the actual water path um, that then gets healed up um, and then it will then get fertilized. Um, and then there's also a, a granular type or also liquid now um, that gets put onto, put onto the plant source. And what that allows it to do is it, it gives it a really good 
um, growth or food to grow. So, so the fertilizer, it's a, it's a slow reacting fertilizer. So it, it gives the plant the nutrients and the food to yep. grow over a certain period. But we also then put in a granular to stop, um, to stop grubs. So I don't know if you've ever seen Jack, but a cane beetle, um, a cane beetle actually comes from a grub and the grub eats out the, um, the plant source or, or the billet in which you've put in the ground if you don't treat it correctly. Um, and then that obviously doesn't let the plant grow. So then we have losses in that area. And that was the reason why they inter introduced to Australia. I don't know if you've heard of them, the cane, the cane toad. Yeah, you, you um, beat me to it. I was just about to say yeah. that's why they brought it in, which out there, I didn't actually know that before learning it. Um, a lot of people probably didn't, that it's actually there for the cane beetle. Yeah, yeah. So so it ate or well, eats the the larva or the beetle. Um, sometimes now we're finding that they're getting a little bit um slack. They're eating <laughs> other stuff, that, which they shouldn't be. But in the actual process, we put down um, um, something to control the the grubs as such from growing and 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 continuing to um to take out the crop so then that's healed up and then after that once once a crop grows um it then gets um worked so cultivated in between the the two plant sources to to maintain you know weed control and stuff like that once the once the crop actually creates its own canopy um, the weeds and whatnot are then um, controlled by by the plant source. So, you know, you can't see no sun. Um, so we get very minimum um, weeds in between the rows. If by chance we have to go through and spray the, the inner rows or, or the water furrow, we do. Um, but then again, it's very controlled because, you know, we have the beautiful Great Barrier Reef just at our doorstep. So we don't want any wash off or anything like that. So then, of course, the farmers will spray the inter rows at a controlled rate. Um, and then from there, Jack, it pretty much just grows. Um, and then the following season, which is normally about a six month window, it will then be harvest. Um, and then once that's harvest, so that's cutting out your plant, then we return that crop. So, so there's a number of things that then we do once the crop is already matured in the ground. We don't have to go back through and plant it. We will go through and do another fertilize on the, on the crop. So give it a little bit more of a boost. Yep. Um, and then we will also then work the inner row. We'll trash incorporate. So if there's some trash that's been um, sucked off the, off the um, billets from the previous cut. So like I said before, the machine has two opportunities to pull the trash off the billet that's going to the, to the mill. We will, we will put that trash back into the ground. Now, this is for burnt cane cutting. There's two different types of, of um, ways that we prepare the crop for harvesting. We either burn the crop or we cut it green. In a lot of areas today, we still um, cut it green. The Burdekin um, is the only area that is 100% burnt. Yep. Um, there is some other areas that will burn some crops if, if the yield is too high or it's too trashy for the machine to actually cut and harvest. Um, but when you have some type of trash matter on the ground in burnt cane, we go through and we um, cut the trash up. So it's called trash incorporating. We mix it into the soil, which is also cultivating it. Then we come through, we fertilize, we then create a little bit of a hill. So we go through and we call, we hill it up again. So we throw and create some type of hill and then we're ready to water again. And then the whole process starts all over again. And ready to rip in again. I think we could grow a crop just going off the way you've explained it. You're very good at explaining things um, and right the way through the process into harvesting as well. Yeah, and look, you know, um, also, Jack, the, the, the industry has, has not changed in the way of how we do um, our farming. But yeah. one thing here in the Burdekin that I've, I've learned a lot um, because I like to talk to farmers and I like to talk to people is understanding how much technology um, is helping our farmers, you know, uh, say, say for instance, with the spraying and, and, the, and the fertilizer, 
all of that is hap all of that happens at a controlled rate. So so we're not over fertilizing, we're not under fertilizing, we're not over spraying, under spraying. What we're trying to do is make every pass that we do on that on that ground um, a benefit for both the the plant and the farmer. Um, back back you know if we go back 20, 20 odd years ago, uh, yes, it was controlled, but it might have been a mechanical wheel being driven on the ground with you know different cogs and whatnot to gear it up or gear it down. Now it's all done by GPS, it's all done by ISO. Um, and, and again, the yield that is coming or the data that's coming from the cane harvester is also helping our farmers to make better decisions on how to maintain their crop for, for of course, a higher return on the investment. Yeah, absolutely. So does that actually pinpoint a day, a time, a pivotal time that, um, so I wrote the question, question down, what was the actual day that the farm changed within the sugar industry? What was that pivotal moment? Because previously, just before you said um, that the innovation and technology is just sort of catching up into the sugar industry and how farmers are actually adopting this change and actually using it to better themselves and their farm. What what was the pivotal point? Was it the uh, Toff Brothers or what was it for Kane? Look, I, I think for sugarcane, um, it's always been an industry that's been wanting to change and, and always embrace um, changes. I think for, I think for us um, in sugar, it's been a lot of, of gathering data and being able to transfer data from, from, say, one piece of equipment to another piece of equipment. So for me, not, not, not to really pinpoint it into a year, a time or whatnot, but for me, I think it's all to do with um, GPS and how we're able to transfer, like I just said, data from one machine to another or even taking data out of the machine every afternoon, bringing it, bringing it home at night time, bringing up maps, um, boundaries, um, stuff like that. So I think the the grain guys um really embraced it quite early you know for us on the case ih um side of it you know we had the afs um uh, uh combines um in the way that they did yield um and whatnot and you know afs has been around a long time in the combine world now afs coming into into the sugar world in the way of our precision farming and and so on our solutions there that we can give to the end user, I think everybody's embracing it a lot more, Jack, because it's actually become easier to embrace. Um, in the past, it's been, you know, we've had to buy either new equipment or we couldn't connect, you know, something new onto the machine. I remember back when I was a technician because I did 10 years um, at the local dealership here, at the local Case H dealership. And when you looked at the first GPS system that ever came to, to the workshop, you know, like it was this big desktop software looking tower yeah. that used to sit on the right hand side next to the door. Now, Jack, you know, uh, some farmers are, are getting tractors and they don't even know that it's got GPS in it. I think, I think the innovation has automatically allowed us to embrace the changes. Was there a time? Time? No. Will there be a time? No, I think we will continue to embrace the changes in what we learn from different parts of the world. And also we look, we look to the grain guys a lot because the grain guys do things in mass scale. Yeah. Um, you know, the way that they seed their crops or the way that they spray their crops, it's all done in big masses. Here, here in the sugar industry, yes, we have a lot of farmers um, up and down the coast that are big farmers and they're always looking for better ways to do it. And I think how the grain guys do it, we can learn a lot from them. And I think we are. Yeah, perfect. I think that's a great way to be improving yourself as your individual farm and also you as a sugar cane, as the industry, being able to move it a little bit further and looking outside your box. Um, Cross-sector learning, I think I'm coined it. Well, I'm claiming I coined um, that phrase in looking outside of the box and seeing how other sort of farmers are doing it, but making it relevant into what you're sort of working with. And it leads us into talking about data, data. It is a pretty big word that's getting thrown around 
within agriculture and how it's actually playing out, how are farmers utilising that data coming through? Maybe it's utilising the AFS system um, within case and how that's working to improve the paddocks, fields within your own operation. How's it working within the sugar industry? Look, look, Jack, again, it's, it's, it's all to do with how we, we don't want no wastage. Um, and, you know, AFS... AFS has brought a lot to um to to a case IH customer, and also other brands that are out there. They have their own solutions, which have brought a, a lot of good impacts um to the sugar industry. I think it's a lot to do with how more how much more precise we are with the actual planting of the sugar. Uh, of sorry of the plant. So so you know back in the day we used to have um they they were like guide wheels. So literally there would be a tractor. They would drive in front. Hopefully, the fellow that was controlling that steering wheel had a really good eye. He yeah. would do nice straight lines, and then someone behind would come and follow the lines that were already put in front. Now, of course, we know that there's always differences between one's person's straight line to another yeah. person's straight line. At the end of that paddock, that may be one or two drills. Yeah. So now we've got guidance. So we know that you know we start on this a b line by the time we get to the other end of the paddock that same a b line is measured and is as straight as the first one that was put in um you know the day before or hours before so i think how we're planting is helping us a lot then the data in which we're getting back from from the um cane harvester in that first cut allows us to see how the yield varies um, from one end of the paddock to the other end or across the field from one side to the other. Yep. That then allows the farmer to make decisions on how he applies his fertiliser. You know, in some areas, Jack, he mightn't have to put on the same rate as another area. Or yep. he may um, look at his yield and say, hey, I should probably get out an agronomist here and see what is my soil actually missing here. You know, does it need more of this or less of this or does it need, you know, something else? So I think data in sugar is actually the one thing that's going to take us into the future and going to make this industry a lot more sustainable um, for the future generations. Because as we all know, the way that technology is driven at a household, whether it's, you know, from an iPad to social media, to the way we order our groceries day in, day out. It's also happening in our farms. You know, a, a farmer can can go on the internet, order his, order his, um, his parts for his next service. He can get in contact with, with his local dealer to book in service or repairs. And now moving forward for us with AFS Connect, um, with our next level of technology coming into our tractors, which will then be fed through into our cane harvesters in the near future, allowing the actual operator customer to talk directly to the dealer and have you know data transferred from from the actual tractor that may be having a concern to the to the dealer and allowing that downtime to be minimised. I think that is what data is going to bring in to the sugar industry is less downtime, more uptime and allowing the farmer to make the right decision and choice. Yeah, exactly. And I think that sounds like a pretty pivotal moment just there, but also the data that we're collecting on farm, whether it be fleet monitoring, agronomic, or just data management out in the paddock as farmers or even contractors within sugar industry, how that can actually play a role in telling the story of what the sugar industry is doing to find the deficiencies and become efficient off the back of that. I think that's a pretty powerful marketing tool as well that we'll be able to use later on because you've actually collected this data. You've moved it, you compiled it and analysed it um, and you've made decisions off the back of that. I think that's a pretty exciting space moving yeah, forward. Yeah, 100%. And and the, the farmers that I talk to very regularly – like, you know, you always have your little network of farmers that you like to bounce different ideas off and and, um, and different opportunities that may be coming um, in the near future. They're, they're, they're all wanting that, Jack. You know, they're, they're all wanting to make improvements. It's I don't believe this is an industry that is going to stand still. Um, I think it's a, an industry that, you know, in the next five to ten years, I think it's going to be very exciting. Um 
you know, farmers uh, are definitely embracing change. Um, and they're also seeing the rewards in, in the changes that they're making. So, you know, with anything that we do as a human being, the more we see the, the reward, the more it drives us to, to try different things or, or to, to embrace um, different changes. Um, and I think the, the sugar industry, whether it's, you know, um, some farmers that I talked to up in Mossman, which are also contractors, all the way down to, you know, Bundaberg that is going through a whole different change in their industry, they're all, they're all embracing it. And I think that's the first step to success is having um, the person accept change. Yeah, exactly. I think that's what it comes down to. And change is in everywhere in agriculture. And it's just amazing to see how far we have come. Probably farmers don't always look back, but it's great to see how far we've actually come from the original cane harvest to the Toff brothers bringing in their own cane harvester. Um, and then case sort of carrying on that tradition within the sugar industry is pretty powerful and the world's our oyster within the sugar industry and agriculture in general. Um, and where we take that data and how we utilize, it's probably the most powerful sort of way that we can move the industry forward. Yeah. And, you know, um, back in the day, we were very, what would we say, lucky um, yeah. to have the Oztoff factory here in Australia, um, you know, for, for different decisions, um, it got moved to Brazil. And, and I think, you know, moving it to Brazil opened up a, a big door for, for us, uh, Case IH, and also for our operators. We saw, we have seen changes um, that have been driven from a global level. As we know, you know, the sugarcane harvester that comes out of our factory in Pirisacaba goes global um, to Australia, Thailand, South Africa, um, in Brazil. It's a global machine. But one thing that I will give um, the Brazil team um, and also our, our marketing um, team, which is also based in the US, credit for, is they've always listened to the Australians. Um, we, we were the pioneers of it. Um, we continue to be the pioneers. Um, one thing that I'm very lucky and grateful for is that, you know, I'm on a lot of project boards. Um, I'm having discussions with engineers daily but, but they're wanting to listen to our farmers and they're wanting to listen to our contractors. And I, I think that's a very important thing, Jack, um, in agricultural industry in general, is we need to listen to the people that are out there growing um, the crop and, and feeding the world because we need to make their job more sustainable um, and we also need to make it easier um, for them in the way that they do it. So I think, you know, Case IH, we, we always pride ourselves on the customer. Um, our, the customer is our number one. Um, and we, we try so hard and we continue to try and to, and to grow our factories and understanding um, the needs and wants of the farmer. Beautiful. And I think removing that barrier to allow for that free information exchange, that farmer feedback and also being the sort of pioneers of cane industry as farmers in Australia, that would be pretty special for them. They may not even think about it like that. They just want to improve their own paddocks and not know they may be influencing what they're doing overseas and within the global market of what case is delivering further afield. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, in saying that, Jack, I, I think um, Australia agricultural should be very proud of themselves, you know, um, no, what, no matter what industry it is and now, you know, dealing with different platforms, both in the Optum and Puma range, yep. um, they definitely do listen to what us Australians have to say. Um, it's definitely taken on board. Um, so, so like you said, I think, I think the, um, the Aussie farmer has a lot to be proud of. Absolutely. Great episode there, Lawrence. Thank you very much for coming on. We've just got a couple of questions before you go. What's your yep. favourite piece of equipment within the sugar industry and why has, has to be um the sugar cane harvester look born and bred in the burdock and um sugar sugar is my life um very very passionate about it and um the cane harvester for me is it just looks like a big transformer um that, that does a remarkable job of eating dirt and um giving a clean sample of, of a billet length at the back end. So for me, it's definitely the cane harvester and uh, probably a little bit boss, but 
I do love the um, Kane Arva stuff. Yeah, I, I really could have picked what you were going to choose there. I think <laughs> it looks like a pretty special machine. We'll have to see what the reception is on social media, Instagram, Twitter, um, of others not in the field of sugar industry to see what it is, what it looks like. It looks pretty special. So for yourself, Lawrence, what would be your number one piece of farms advice that you'd like listeners to take away from this case episode um, with yourself? in the sugar industry? Look, for me, Jack, it's um, don't be afraid of change. Embrace it. Um, learn learn from each other. I think, you know, every farmer has a story to tell and every farmer has a way to improve, improve both their profitability and also their yield. And it, it all comes back to change. Um, I, I love a person who, who will embrace change. Um, and, you know, sometimes you do, make the wrong choices but you got to learn and keep moving forward so for me it's um embrace change thank you mate well i really appreciate that i think we've just driven in the ute i hopped in the ute with you from all the way from bundaberg to mossman around the cane farms just to see what they're doing the way you explained it was really special and also probably the first episode within the sugar industry on the farms vice podcast but for anyone wanting to reach into your generational expertise and the team at Case IH, how can people contact you? Do you have a social media handle that we, we can go to? Yeah, definitely. You know, you, you can um, get us on our website um, and the the girls that sit behind our website will definitely pass on the information um, to myself. Yep. Um, and you can also drop us uh, drop us a message on, on Twitter and Facebook um, or also follow us on Instagram, like our stories. Um, put a comment and be more than happy to catch up over a coffee, a beer, or even a chit chat on the phone. Um, I'm, I'm always willing to talk to our farmers and, and learn from them because I think they've got so much to, to give us younger generations um, that are very passionate about moving this industry into the, into the future. Certainly do Lawrence. And you've also given some pretty good advice for today. Well, Lawrence, thank you very much for coming on to the Farms Vice podcast and especially on the Case IH series. This is going to be a really good series. Looking forward to seeing what the reception is. Thanks a lot, Jack, for having me. This Farms Vice episode does not stop here. Come and join the conversation on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok, and even join our Facebook group. Go to farmsadvice.com.au for more on this episode and spread the hashtag farmsadvice to your mates. If you can leave a review on Apple or Spotify, that will let other farmers find us too. But until then, see you next Tuesday. In the spirit of reconciliation, the Farms Advice podcast acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people today.